I've been working on this knife for six months. It's definitely one of my all-time favorite knives. Houston, we have a problem. Whoa, look at that. What you are about to see is a project that I've poured my heart and soul into. This has got to be one of my masterpieces. It's even better than I imagined. I already have the blade done. That's why the next thing is to fit the guard onto the knife. I love fitting guards because it's fun to try to get as close to fitting the guard with the mill as I possibly can without using files. If you want to see me make the Damascus for this knife, the link is in the description for part one where I forge the Damascus for this massive buoy. I'm using the new Precision Grizzly Mill that we purchased. I say new, but we've had it around for about a year now. It's quite a large upgrade from my old milling machine. What I love about this milling machine is its variable speed, which means I don't have to stick my hands up inside the frame to change belts to different size pulleys. That's really nice because you can change the speed very quickly and you don't end up scuffing your arms up when you're trying to pull belts over other pulleys and loosen this and that and tighten things back up. It makes it quick and on the fly. Now that it's so easy to change speeds on this milling machine, I find myself using a wider range of speeds more often. For this operation, cutting out the slot in the guard, I've got the milling machine turned up pretty fast. All right, time for more math. So the final size I've got here, 51. Let's make it 250 even. 250 minus 125, well, duh, 125, divided by two is a 16th inch. 62.5, 62. I'm gonna go 62. Give myself two thousandths of an inch. Dad installed the DRO onto this machine, which tells me exactly where the table is. It's very accurate, down to like half a thousandth of an inch. Having the DRO there to tell me the exact position that my guard is in is very handy. In the past, I've done milling without the DRO using dial indicators. That works really well, but it takes more setup in order to get the dial indicators all set up where you need them. I'm still widening out the slot in the guard. I'm going down one side of the guard all the way to the end, and then I go over to the other side and come back the other direction. I'm just taking a few thousandths of an inch off at a time. And when I get really close to my final pass, I'll only take off like one thousandth of an inch just for a final clean pass. If my math was correct, the slot in the guard should now be approximately one to maybe one and a half thousandths of an inch narrower than the part of the tang that I want it to slide up onto. So that should make it so it just hammers on and has a beautifully tight fit with minimal filing, hopefully. See how that fits. Oh, I think it's gonna fit beautifully. So now that I've got it about an eighth of an inch away, I wanna hammer the guard on and hopefully have a beautiful tight fit. That's probably enough. It was like 10 feet of tape. Whenever you're hammering tape down like this on a blade, you've gotta make sure your hammer has carbide tips on it. If it doesn't have carbide tips, it will not seat the tape properly. My friend Korn from Australia makes and sells these hammers. They are gorgeous. They are the best tape setting hammers I've ever used. Well, that is a big blade. I would like more offset jaw for this. Actually, I love that vise in Australia for this. They had the, the jaw was completely offset. Then you could put the blade like right in the middle of it and not have to worry about it hitting anything. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Houston, we have a problem. The punches won't reach. Uh, maybe it's time we can trim the excess off the end of this tang that we don't need, because I have to now. Mm, about that much. Can't really use the bandsaw, because it'll destroy it. Chop saw blades worn out and short. <sighs> Torch. Oh, that'd be fun. <laughs> That'd actually be fun for the video. I decided to grind that excess length on the end of the tang down using the two x 72 grinder with kind of a worn out 36 grit belt. It's pretty satisfying to grind away so much material so quickly on the end of the tang there. 
Also, you can see how much heat is being created by this as the end of the tang is heated up to a blue slash gray color. That'll be fine because later on we're going to normalize the end of the tang anyway and soften it up more so we can thread it. All right. We're going in for take two. Trim some off the end of the tang there. Got it pretty much to the, uh, the, the finished length it'll need to be. See if we have any. Oh, oh, no, that one's that one's going to bottom out. We're getting closer. I think this one might have a little more room. Yeah, there we go. There we go. This one will have enough room. That should work beautifully. Okay, that should be about enough. And now we repeat the process of guard on, guard off with a little filing in between. Now you can see a little polished area right here towards the top of the guard where the tang is rubbing on it. So I can go and selectively remove a little bit of material and then hammer it on again until we get closer and closer to fitting up to the Ricasso. After a little bit of hand filing and some more fitting, now I can go in and make a relief about 15 thousandths of an inch deep with a small end mill bit. The reason I need this relief on the face of the guard is so that we can continue fitting the knife into the guard. In this case, I'm actually gonna inlay the Ricasso of the knife into the guard about 10 thousandths of an inch. I like to make my guards like this so they fit like a glove onto the blade. And you'll never see any kind of gaps or daylight or anything shining through between the blade and guard fit up. For this milling operation, I'm just milling it by eye. I have some scribe lines where I marked around the Ricasso onto the face of the guard. And I'm just trying to get close to those scribe lines and not actually go over them. After that milling operation is complete, a little more hand filing is required. I'm gonna put a bit of a bevel where the tang of the guard meets up with the blade. The reason I'm doing that is because I find a lot of times there'll be a little bit of extra material right there. So having this bevel will just get that material out of the way and make it easier for me to fit this guard up. After removing that material with the mill, the Ricasso now is beginning to leave an outline right around the edges and I can go in with the high-speed dental burr and the microscope and remove some of that material right up to where uh, where the Ricasso is not hitting anymore. And then we'll slowly get this to fit up over the Ricasso about 15 thousandths of an inch. It'll fit into the guard about 15 thousandths of an inch because that's how deep that recess is I just made on the mill. So I'm gonna keep eating away at the sides and hammering this on and eating away at the sides of the dental burr until the rest of the Ricasso hits on that little flat area that I just milled out as the relief. The high-speed dental burr in combination with my engraver microscope is an amazing tool. This thing turns at 320,000 RPM. For reference, your regular run-of-the-mill Dremel tool turns at 35,000, so this thing is screaming fast, but it hardly has any torque at all. I went between the high-speed dental burr hammering the guard on, hammering it back off, and then the high-speed dental burr probably four or five times, and I think I'm done fitting the guard. It fits beautifully tight now. I also did a little bit of filing to make it so it's not on there quite so hard. I don't wanna have to, to bang on the end of the tang with a sledgehammer in order to get it off. I want it to be nice and tight, you know, tight enough I can't pull it off and push it on by hand, but not tight enough to where I gotta hit it really hard to get it on there. And I think I've got it at that perfect sweet spot that is good to go for the rest of the knife. I need to make sure that it's nice and square looking because the entire handle is gonna be built kind of based off this guard. So if something's out of whack here with the guard, then that can kind of lead to compounding problems as you go down the rest of the handle construction. But as far as I can tell in the first quick look, it's looking so good and so tight. That Ricasso is literally inlaid into the guard. Literally, 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 literally inlaid into the guard. Now it's time to begin working on my second ever stone handle. This handle is going to be made from lapis lazuli. I've got a gorgeous piece of lapis lined up for the project. It's got a very rich, deep blue color. And the lapis, a lot of times, will have many layers where there's nice blue color and then there'll be a lot of gray or white rock in between. Well, this piece is special because there's hardly any of those gray layers. The thing is almost solid blue with only a little bit of that grayish white streaking through the middle of it. First thing I need is good layout lines. I need to carefully lay out my two handle segments. 
I want to keep both of my handle segments running in the same direction on the stone as well. I don't want the grain of the stone to be going a different direction on one piece of the handle versus the other. Once the layout's done, I can begin cutting out the pieces on a regular tile saw. This tile saw is one that dad happens to own from doing years of remodeling and new home construction. I was a little nervous going into cutting up this lapis. I'd never cut it up on a tile saw before. I was worried that big chunks of it could break off, but the tile saw did an amazing job and the chips I got from the saw blade were very tiny and very minimal. I was able to pick up this gorgeous piece of lapis lazuli from the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show last year. I went there with my mom and brother Josh and we had a great time buying all sorts of cool rocks. Now comes one of the longer and tedious parts, shaping this blocky square chunk of rock down into a nicely shaped handle. I'm using one of Covington's rock grinding machines and I've got a wheel with 60 grit diamond on it that I'm shaping this down with. This wheel might be a little bit on the fine side for doing all this shaping, but I didn't want to get a wheel that was so coarse that it caused giant chips of the rock to break off as I shaped it. Also, you might notice the fans blowing right on me. It was very hot outside when I was shaping this handle. I finished shaping the lapis lazuli handle and it is looking absolutely amazing. I love how this handle is looking. I took it all the way up to 1000 grit. So it has a 1000 grit kind of satiny finish on it right now. The only thing left to do to finish out the stone portions of the handle are to put the final polish on the stone. I'm not gonna do that right now though. I'm gonna probably do that after the engraving and stuff is done. We'll come back and do that final, final polish. As a little sneak peek though, to see what the final polish would look like, I uh, practiced polishing on this scrap piece of lazuli and it's gonna be incredible once we get that final polish on here. I've also spent a few days practicing the engraving for this knife. This knife is gonna get engraving covering both sides of the guard, pretty much covering all the way around the front spacer, the middle spacer, and the back pommel spacer, and we're gonna do some on the end of the pommel nut too. Part of the reason why I named this knife Starry Knight is because of the blue handle with all the little pyrite gold specks in it. Really look a lot like uh, Van Gogh's Starry Knight, but also because of the engraving theme we're gonna do. We're gonna do this shooting star style uh, engraving all over the fittings. And that's gonna involve some big stars with like a shooting star tail on them, all done in 24 karat gold. And then in the background, we're gonna have a bunch of little dots of stars you know, light years out into the distance, really tiny ones, really, really far away. And those are gonna be a combination of 24 karat gold and argentium silver, kind of spitter spattered and mixed in there. I think it's gonna look absolutely amazing. I did a bunch of practice on this piece. I've got a couple different uh, styles and I've got one that I'm very happy with, with a bunch of bright cuts all over it. So it just shimmers and shines in the light and actually looks like a bright star. Keep in mind, when you see this practice piece, it is just silver that I used for the main stars. The real thing is actually gonna be gold, so that minor change, but the concept is the same. I'm inside of my engraving setup. I've got some layout lines on my guard. I'm gonna go ahead and cut in the border around the guard before I start working on the actual design. For this, I'm using a carbide graver with a point on it, and I've got my microscope so I can see super close what I'm doing, and I can rotate and move things around in this vise right here. There's something so satisfying about cutting away steel with a chisel. Just having that burr pop up and seeing that metal being physically removed with a chisel. It's really kind of mesmerizing. I make tons of little adjustments as I cut away the material. I have to constantly be correcting the chisel to make sure that it doesn't veer too far to the right or too far to the left. But what I'm doing even more is correcting the depth. I'm constantly tilting the graver up and down. Tilting it up a little bit will make it dig deeper into the metal, and tilting it down will make it go shallower. If you go too far down, it'll come out so shallow that you'll end up popping out of the metal and skating across the top. You might even put a giant scar or scratch right across your part if you're not careful. I finished cutting the border all the way around the guard. The next thing I want to focus on is creating the big stars on the ends of the guard. These are going to be extra large compared to the rest of the stars on the project just because these are going to be the main stars and there's a lot of area here so we can do nice big ones. I've already got a little bit of layout. I'm going to start cutting these in using my pointed graver here. The deeper I cut with my graver, the wider the groove will be. That's how I can make these dynamic cuts for the star. 
The cut starts out extremely shallow and towards the center of the star it gets very very deep and widens out. These are eight pointed stars that I'm cutting in. First I like to just cut the grooves in, not super deep, and then I go back through each one making them deeper and deeper. I'm using a 90 degree point on my graver right now. Once I get the grooves deeper, I'll widen out the groove with a 105 degree point. Start with the up and down points, and then I'll do the side points, and then the 45 degree angled points. I wanna keep going over these cuts to make them deeper and deeper so they have more of a taper, they'll be less skinny, and they'll make the center of the star have a lot more gold in it. Right now the guard's clamped in the middle of the guard, and the ends of it where I'm engraving these stars are kind of free floating. Even though the guard's pretty thick, I'm making some very deep aggressive cuts, and the vibration is causing some of that power to be lost in translation. I have to give the handpiece some extra gas with the foot pedal to make sure I cut these grooves deep and wide enough. I finish making all the grooves as deep as I need to go for the star. The next thing I wanna do is widen them out a little bit. So I've got a different graver here that has a different geometry on the edge. I'm just gonna pop that in here and we're gonna widen out all these grooves. These stars on the ends of the guard are gonna be what your eye's drawn to right away. They're kind of the main highlight of the entire engraving. So I wanna make sure these stars look Something exactly like how I want them to because they're gonna really catch your attention. The first graver I was using was a 90 degree point. The graver I'm using now that is a wider geometry is a 120 degree point. Even though 90 to 120 degrees doesn't sound that different, it is enough to make a noticeable difference in the end and how wide and full these grooves are gonna look, especially when they're filled with gold. I'm done cutting that large star on the end of the guard. Next I have four small stars that I wanna cut on the side of the guard. I finished cutting in all of our stars. We've got the large ones on the ends of the guard, and then I went ahead and put in some little ones here in this little flat area on the side of the guard. The idea behind these stars was to make them look as organic as I could get them, so they're all different sizes and they're all kind of laid out differently. And on the other side of the guard, I just have three stars, and again, they're different sizes laid out in kind of a random order. The next thing I need to do is add in the tails of the stars that make these two big stars look like they're actually shooting stars. So they're gonna have these big sweeping tails that go all the way down to here on both sides. When it comes to the tail of the star, I'm actually just drawing it in by hand. First, I just take this clay and tap it around on the metal and it leaves a little bit of a residue. And that residue of the clay on the metal makes it so my pencil will show up a little bit better. You can already use a pencil on the metal, but this just makes it show up a lot better. And if I need to, I can erase it, tap it back on there, and do my line again. So I'm gonna hand draw in the middle part of the tail. I'll cut that in and then we'll add in all the little flared bits that come off the middle. Here's the center tail of the shooting star. I'm gonna go ahead and cut this in before doing any more layout. Stay on target, stay on target, almost there. Oh, can't see, cannot see what I'm doing. Can't see what I'm doing, there's a giant burn in my face. Hopefully that's right.
Here's the center of the shooting star cut in. I've also done the layout for the little side shoots and I can go ahead and start cutting these in. What I need to do is make sure that everything blends right in with that center line here. That's gonna be the trickiest part. I finished all the dovetailing down in the grooves. What the dovetails do is actually widen out the bottom of the groove. So the very bottom is wider than the top of the groove. And so when I smash the gold down into the dovetail, it fills out the wider area at the bottom and it mechanically locks the gold in place so it can't move. Our grooves are now ready to inlay the 24 karat gold into. I'm gonna start with the large star here on the end and the way I wanna do this is by melting a ball of gold. I'll just take this small wire and we'll use a torch to melt a ball. And it's a really cool process. We can make a ball however big we want to. And then I'm gonna fill out the middle of the star with that ball. And I'll fill out each little tip of the star with little pieces of wire. Another cool thing about inlaying 24 karat gold is you can smash different pieces together. And when it's all sanded down flush and finish, it looks like it's all one piece of gold. You'll never see the seams or anything. It's really cool. Here's the gold ball for the center of the star. It took about one inch of the gold wire to make the ball this big. This is a really big star, so I needed as much gold as I could get. If I made the ball any larger, it was probably gonna start to fall off the wire and hit the ground and just splatter and disappear. So it's about as big as I could go uh, with this size wire at least. I'm gonna smash this right in the middle and start to get this to fill out the star. It's not gonna fill out the entire thing though. With smaller stars, you can get it to fill out the, uh, the whole thing. But this star is so big that I'm gonna fill out the tips using individual wires. I've got a brass rod on the end of my handpiece here and I'm gonna use that to smash in the gold. The 24 karat gold's nice and soft so I can just use this old razor knife blade to cut off the wire. I'm gonna let this gold stick up just a little bit. It'll help me blend in all these little pieces I'm gonna add for the star next. I'm gonna go ahead and melt a little tiny ball on the end of the wire, just to help me fill out the area where the gold meets. And then we'll start sticking individual wires into each one of the little tips of the star. Smashing the 24 karat gold into the grooves is one of my favorite parts of engraving. It's so satisfying to see how soft the gold is in comparison to the metal around it. 24 karat gold is relatively hard compared to some other things like, I don't know, wood, paper, or jello, but it's a lot, lot softer than something like this stainless steel that the guard is made out of. I said smashing the 24 karat gold in place is one of my favorite parts of engraving. Well, that's not entirely true 100% of the time. Well, sometimes it's not my favorite part, and that time is when I've made the grooves too large for the gold wire that I have on hand. In that case, it's not fun at all because I either have to buy some larger gold or grind the surface of the material down to make the groove smaller. Or what I end up doing most of the time is smashing that wire into the groove that it's just a little bit too small to fill. And that makes it so the gold wire goes below the surface of the metal just a little bit. But normally it comes out looking 100% good. I just have to hand sand the surface of the metal down until it reaches the surface of the gold. The most fun I ever have when I'm inlaying gold is when I've made just the perfect size groove to utilize the entire thickness of the gold wire that I purchased for it without making the groove too big and running a little low on gold wire to fill the groove or without making the groove a little bit too small and end up having a lot of wasted gold. On the other hand, sometimes I can make the grooves a little bit smaller than the gold wire will fill. And when you smash that gold into place, you'll have more wasted wire on top. You'll have extra gold 
up on top of the surface of the material that you end up sanding off and uh, most of the time it ends up on the floor and it's just a little bit sad because I could have made that groove slightly bigger and then it would have been perfect. Something I always strive for and it's really fun when I hit it is when you make that perfect size groove to where the wire you purchased for the project fills the groove in just right. The groove isn't too big. It's not too small to where you're wasting gold. It's that Goldilocks middle. There was so much engraving on this knife that some of the grooves I made were that perfect size and some of them were a little bit too big and some of them were a little bit on the small side. I find most of the time what I end up doing though is making the groove ever so slightly on the large side. Not large enough to where I need to use a larger diameter wire, but large enough that it just annoys me a little bit because I'll have to sand the surface of the metal down just a little more than I would have had to. You may have noticed the little rod on the graver handpiece I'm using looks like it's gold or something kind of that color. Well, it's actually brass. I like hammering the gold in with something that's a little bit soft. That way, if I kind of go off the gold and hit my guard, it's not gonna ding up my guard or really uh, round over a corner or something like that if I mess up a little bit. I do have some other rods that are harder or softer depending on what I'm doing, but most of the time I like the brass rod to smash the gold into place. It's normally only when I'm inlaying harder materials like silver wire inlay that I have to use a harder rod on my handpiece. All right, that's it. Gold inlay on the guard is inlaid. Hey, Josh, ready to go out and get picture, pictures? You ready to go get some of those moving pictures of me hand sanding the guard now? Some of them moving, some of them newfangled moving pictures? From the director of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. An unexpected direction by Peter Jackson, who thought he wasn't going to have to direct the movie. But it turns out the guy that was going to direct it mysteriously fell out years into development. So Peter Jackson has to pick up where he left off. With only weeks before the shoot begins, there's not time to change anything. It doesn't matter, though. It'll make three billion dollars because the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> The gold inlay is looking really good. The next thing I need to do is take some 220 grit sandpaper, start sanding off all the excess, get everything sanded down flush and flat again, and then we can move on to cutting away the background. Those pieces are almost big enough to save. Overall, I would say I had to do a medium amount of hand sanding on this guard. There were a lot of areas that had just the right size grooves with just the right amount of gold filling them and they were easy to hand sand. And there were a good number of areas too where the grooves were a little bit on the large side and I had to sand down the surface of the guard just a little bit in order to get back to flat, fresh playing field on everything. Now that I'm done rough hand sanding the guard, the next step is to begin cutting around the border of all the gold inlays. This is the first step of removing the background in all the negative space areas of the engraving design. Little did I realize until too late that the design I created for this knife was going to consume a lot of time in background removal. The background removal was by far the most time consuming part of this entire engraving that I did because the design I chose does have a lot of background and there were a lot of steps in order to get the background looking how I wanted it. For now though, this part of the background removal is pretty fun because all I have to do is go around the border of the gold and cut in some nice deep lines. Stage two of the background removal is pretty fun too. This is where I get the high speed dental burr back out and we remove all that extra material out in the open areas of the background. The graver in the previous stage was good for creating a border that I could cut up to and now the dental burr can just go to town and hog out that material. The thing I need to be most careful about right now is trying to keep the depth consistent. It's going to be kind of impossible to keep it all perfect, but overall I want to keep the background depth consistent across the project. I removed all the background with the high speed dental burr, but it leaves a really rough background area. There's a lot of high ridges and a lot of low spots and I want to smooth it all and flatten it. 
So I started out using a flat graver and cutting it flat, but that was taking a ton of time. I wanted to save some time, so I was trying to think of what I could do. Well, I recently got to see Sam Alfano do a sculpting class where he literally sculpts leaves using a small punch. And so I had the idea I could make a couple small punches and flatten the background. I'm not gonna be sculpting anything per se, but it works amazingly well to flatten out all these high and low spots and make my background look super smooth and even. Here's a section that shows the dental burr finish. You can see how rough and coarse that is. And then up here on the rest of the guard, I've already gone over it with the punches and smoothed out the background. I've got a nice flat, smooth background ready for texturing. Flattening the background with this idea that I got from watching Sam Alfano do a demo was so satisfying and rewarding. It was really fun to just see through the microscope this rough cut up background smoothing right out and get nice and ready for texturing. I flattened a couple of the areas of the background using a big wide flat graver and that worked really well as well but it took me three, four times longer than just going over it with this flat punch, smoothing everything out. All the background's nice and flat. One of the final stages is to actually texture the background. So for this, I've got a carbide graver point here. It comes down to a really fine point and then it's rounded off just a little bit. So it's not a sharp point. It's kind of like a, a polished ball point pin, only a little bit smaller. And I'm just gonna take this and start covering the entire background with texture. Something else I had to play around with a bit in order to get set up right was the stroke speed of the graver handpiece I'm using. If the speed was too high, I noticed my little point would just want to dig in and make a groove into the metal and it wouldn't kind of bounce around and make nice texture. If it was too low, it would make nice texture, but it was bouncing around too slowly and it was just taking forever in order to cover everything in texture. And now, a word from our sponsor, Kyle Royer. I just made a course where I teach you everything you need to know to pass your Journeyman Smith performance test with confidence. If you're interested, then become a member of LearnKnifeMaking.com today. The link is in the description. And here's a look at how the finished texturing looks on the background. It's got a nice frosty look to it, and I think when we darken it, it's going to look amazing. Next up on the agenda of things to do in this engraving is to once again, go back to the high speed dental burr and start cutting in a bunch of random little holes into the background. I say random because I'm trying to keep the locations somewhat random and make them look sporadic because we're gonna fill each one of these little holes with some 24 karat gold. The reason for that is these are supposed to look like stars when it's all done, little tiny stars distant in the background. I'm gonna fill each one of these little dental burr holes with silver or 24 karat gold. Mostly 24 karat gold with only a few of them being silver. I'm making the hole deep enough that it doesn't need dovetailed or anything. You can just smash the gold or silver into the hole and it'll go so deep that it'll never be coming out. You could even be picking at it with something like a little tiny point and that gold or silver will not come out. The tool I'm using to drive the gold and silver in place has a little tiny dome on the end of it. And that'll allow the gold or silver to be domed up just a little bit above the surface of the background. And being round, they should reflect light very nicely because they'll be kind of polished in the end too. My hope is that these little stars will twinkle or reflect light just a little bit in the background and really resemble some distant stars. To inlay one of these stars, I take my 24 karat gold wire and I melt a little tiny ball of gold on the very end of the wire with a torch. Then I can take my domed punch and drive that little ball of gold down into the hole I cut in the background. That'll simultaneously inlay the gold and make the top of the gold that you see visible have a nice dome to it. As I'm inlaying the gold dot, the punch kind of cuts the gold wire right off and I don't even have to cut it off with another tool. After I'm done punching the dot into place, I can take a really fine pointed carbide scribe and scrape away a little bit of excess gold right around the edge of the dot just to clean it up a little bit. One of the trickiest parts for me inlaying all these dots was trying to keep the pattern really random and sporadic. For the way I do things, I'm used to having grid orders and keeping things really orderly and in line. So making these stars kind of random was more of a challenge for me than keeping them all orderly. 
it was a fun challenge for me and that's something that I want to improve on as well. I want to get better in my knife making with doing more organic things that aren't perfectly ordered. The engraving is almost done, but I still need to bright cut all the stars and all the little shooting star tails. To do this, I'm going to use a round carbide graver. I'm going to put a little tiny bit of a heel on it and I'm going to make the graver super polished and shiny because whatever finish I have on the heel of this graver, it's gonna leave that finish on the gold. Because it's a rounded graver, it's gonna cut out a rounded little groove into the gold, which will help reflect light and make everything sparkle and shine even more. Every couple minutes, I repolish my graver just for a few seconds on the hone, and that keeps it nice and shiny so that all the gold ends up nice and shiny too. It's hard to even show on video how much of a difference this actually makes to the final engraving. You can see side by side one of the hand sanded gold stars right next to the freshly bright cut gold star. And the bright cut one is so shiny that the video has a hard time capturing what it truly looks like. I finished bright cutting all the gold on the guard and it is looking amazing. The next step I need to do is darken all the background. For this, I'm gonna use this Rust-Oleum two times satin finish, two times coverage. This stuff is really thick and it'll darken the background beautifully. If you're wondering, like I first was when I used this paint, if it would be durable enough to hold up in the background of the engraving, it absolutely will. This little logo that I etched onto my calipers that I use all the time has held up wonderfully and I've had it on there for almost a year now and the paint hasn't faded or scratched or gotten eaten away by acetone or anything yet. It's holding up very nice. So that's been a great durability test on my calipers that I use in the shop all the time. I'm gonna hose this guard down with some acetone, get it nice and clean, and then we're gonna give it nice even coatings of this satin black Rust-Oleum on both sides. I'm gonna let it dry for a minute, and then we're gonna wipe it down with this microfiber cloth. I had to try a bunch of different microfiber cloths and paper towels and anything I can get my hand on. The problem I was running into was stuff left fuzzes down in the paint, and this was the best thing I found so far that wouldn't, this brand of microfiber. I start by cleaning off my part really well with acetone, and then I blow everything off dry with some compressed air. Next, I can take the two times coverage paint and put a medium thick coat on both sides of the guard, both sides of the guard that have engraving that is. Then I need to let it dry for about 30 seconds to a minute and start wiping down the guard with acetone on a microfiber cloth. Getting just the right amount of acetone on the cloth was key to success here. Too much acetone and it runs all over and you end up wiping the paint right out of the background. And without enough acetone, I wasn't able to remove enough of the paint off the surface of the engraving. Wow, that's really coming to life, look at that. <laughs> My first time seeing this. Look at all that background removal I did. <laughs> I finished wiping down the guard with the microfiber cloth and acetone. There's still a little bit of black on the large stars on the top and bottom here. I'm gonna go in with a fine pointed Q-tip and get rid of that, that last little bit of paint. Besides that, I need to let this set aside for an hour or two for the paint to dry and then I'll go in and polish the little tiny dots in the background that represent stars. I'm gonna use a carbide scribe with the end of it rounded and polished and it'll make each one of those stars kind of have a nice brilliance so they'll stand out and sparkle a little bit. Now that the engraving's pretty much finished, I wanna focus my attention on the blade. I still have a little bit of hand sanding left to do, and then we can move on to revealing the pattern through the ferric chloride etch and the coffee darkening process. I'm in my kitchen. I've got the ferric chloride all set up in this tube. I need to get my blade cleaned up really nicely, and then we can dip it in the acid to actually etch the Damascus. I got the blade clean, it's going into the ferric chloride etch. Six minutes on light towel. My blade's been etching for about six minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and take it out and have a look. Whoa, look at that. It looks so good. It looks like it's etching beautifully even so far. Wow, that's gonna look amazing. Once we get this fully etched and coffee darkened, it's gonna be incredible. Need to go ahead and get this rinsed off and we're gonna get it into some neutralizer and then I'm gonna sand all these oxides off with some 3000 grit sandpaper. Then we're gonna put it back in the etch for another cycle and we'll do that multiple times. 
You wanna sand all those oxides off just to get a nicer, cleaner etch. Cause the oxides can build up on there and kind of, uh, kind of resist the etch after a while. So I like to clean them off every couple minutes. Now the blade's gonna neutralize a little bit in some baking soda water just for a couple of minutes. Took the blade out of the neutralizer and now I'm sanding off all the oxides on the blade. So when I put it back into the ferric chloride, it can get a nice clean etch. The blade's done etching and neutralizing. Now I'm gonna put it into some instant coffee mixture here. This is just a little bit of water with a bunch of instant coffee. I'm using uh, some decaf coffee this time. Dad was trying it out and it worked really well for him, so I'm gonna try it out on this blade. I've got it suspended in here. I'm just gonna hang it on these wires and I'm gonna let it soak for probably four to eight hours. This is gonna darken up all the 1084 on the blade and make it look amazing. Eight hours later. The etch on the blade is finished. I left it in the coffee for about eight hours. Then I took the blade out, let it sit overnight. I like to let all those oxides solidify and get really durable. And then I rubbed over the entire blade with some sunshine cloth. It's just got micro abrasive in it just to polish off all the tinted yellow that was on the 15 and 20, get everything looking really good. And then I applied a Carnuba wax finish to the blade. It makes the dark finish even more durable, adds a protective layer to the blade to protect it from oxidizing and rust and stuff like that. And it just looks absolutely incredible. I love how this blade came out. The Damascus pattern etched so beautifully. It's got so much contrast and chatoyance when you move it around in the light. It came out awesome. Now that the blade's done and the fittings are done, we have one more component to finish, and that is the lapis lazuli handle. These handle pieces need polished. They're currently sanded out to 1000 grit, and I've already done a ton of practicing on this little piece of lapis from the same stone to get the perfect polish on this that I want. It took me so many hours, I don't even wanna think about it in order to get this polish on the stone. I hope it works on the real thing. I tried so many different compounds and speeds and types of belts and polishing pads and all sorts of things. The thing in the end that ended up getting the best shiny finish with the minimal amount of orange peeling texture for me was this 14,000 mesh diamond compound applied to a two by 72 leather belt on my grinder running at a low RPM. I tried so many different types of belts and compounds and grits in order to get the best shine I possibly could on this lapis. One of the problems I ran into was that some things would make it pretty shiny, but they would also give it a horrible orange peel. So you had to balance how shiny you wanted it to look with how much orange peel you wanted to get on the stone. This brand new leather belt without any oils or anything on it was the best thing by far that I found with just a little bit of 14,000 grit diamond uh, compound on it. It was able to get the stone looking very nice and shiny with minimal orange peel. At long last, I am done polishing the lapis lazuli handle pieces for the Starry Night buoy. I spent so, so much time polishing these handles. Just as in life, I find a lot of times practice doesn't really go the same as the real thing a lot of the times. And it was definitely the case when polishing these handle pieces. I practiced on a piece of lapis from the same rock as the handle material. And I got the finish looking beautiful, nice and shiny polished. But then when it came to the real thing, it wasn't happening the same. I couldn't get the same sheen. I had to try so many different things. I spent a couple days trial and airing my way through it, trying to get the absolute shiniest deep sheen I could on the handle material. One of the problems I ran into with polishing the lapis is that you can easily orange peel the texture. So if you polish on it too much, it'll actually start to get a lot of texture on the surface and that's not what I wanted. I wanted a smooth glassy surface or as close to it as I could get. I went through a couple different belts, trying different compounds and diamond abrasives and all sorts of things. And I think my main belt that I'd gotten the process down with, I think it just got too much oily compound on it. So I had to buy a brand new belt and use some really fine diamond spray on it and try to keep everything nice and dry. And that did the trick. I got it really shiny 
and I'm very, very happy with how this lapis looks. It's incredible. It's so shiny, it's so deep blue. There's so many little details to look at here. We've got the little pyrite pieces of gold, and there's a bunch of little white streaks here and there that just add a lot to look at, all mixed in that deep blue sea. I love how this handle looks, and I can't wait to see how this looks on the knife all put together. At long last, it's finally time to put the Starry Night buoy together. They're all done, the components are finished. We've got this beautifully etched, ginormous blade. We've got the pommel etched, the handle material is polished and shaped, and all the gold and inlaying has been done on the fittings. Let's get all the pieces put together. The first piece is the blade. Guard, front spacer, front lapis handle piece, front piece of lapis lazuli handle, middle spacer, rear lapis lazuli handle piece. <laughs> so Next, the Damascus pommel needs lineup pins. Lightly tap lineup pin, add second lineup pin, tap into place. Add Damascus pommel to engraved stainless pommel. Add pommel assembly to lapis handle. Add the final piece, engraved stainless pommel nut. Tighten up pommel nut, good and firm. And it's done. <laughs> wow, wow. It's even better than I imagined. Oh my goodness. This, this has got to be one of my masterpieces. This is incredible because of all the detail in the engraving and this blue lapis handle and this massive, massive double-edged blade. This is one of my favorite pieces of all time. It's got to be this one. There's so much gold in the fittings. All those little dots. All the bright cut, all those lines of gold are bright cut, which makes them sparkle and dance in the light. It looks so good with the blue handle. So good. I have not seen this all put together. Last time I put this whole knife together, the blade wasn't finished, the fittings weren't engraved, and the handle wasn't polished. So it is such a treat to see it all done and together. Wow. This took so much more time than I was planning. I probably spent nearly twice as much time on this knife than I was thinking I would. And most of that comes down to the engraving. It was very, very time consuming. It looks so good. Oh, a little star on the pommel nut there with the Damascus pommel end cap. Wow. The only time I've ever gotten blue colors on a knife were when I used uh, like dyed and stabilized woods before. But even then it wasn't a natural deep blue like in a stone. This is incredible that this exists in nature. The finish on the blade came out so good. It's so chatoyant. One of my absolute favorite parts of the Starry Night buoy is the engraving. I love the shooting stars that are all bright cut, shiny and chatoyant. All the little tiny silver dots I added in, I just added a few in there just for a little speck of silver color. And then a ton of gold dots, two different sizes. We've got big ones, we've got little ones just taking up the entire background. And also I love how deep the background is and how black it is anywhere there aren't stars and the relation between all the engraving and this lapis lazuli blue handle is incredible. Seeing this thing all put together, it's just, I just wanna sit here and keep looking at it, even though I've spent the last five, six months looking at this knife pretty much every day, I just wanna look at it all put together and finally finished. Mom, do you wanna see this? Woo, wow. That's got so much going on, that's amazing. Love that engraving. Wow. 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 <laughs> it looks a lot more when it's all put together instead of pieces. I yeah. love it. <laughs> oh, man. Isn't that blue handle incredible with the, all the gold? Stone. <laughs>
It's not even wood. It's, it's not dyed or anything. Yeah. I hope this Starry Night buoy can inspire you to make something creative. I've wanted to do stone for 12 years, and I can't believe I waited so long to do it. This is my second ever stone handle. I was just able to do the first one earlier this year, and once again, I am blown away. It's so cool to be able to work with something so beautiful that came right out of nature. Also, when it came to the engraving on this project, it took so much time, and there were times when I thought I was never gonna get it done, but I'm so glad that I saw it through. It came out really, really cool. Push the boundaries of what's possible. If you have cool ideas for whatever creative thing you're into, then just go for it and see if you can make it happen. If you can push through and see that creative idea to its end, you might end up with something truly incredible and inspiring to yourself and other people as well. I will see you in the next video. May the forge be with you. Bye-bye.